we're now what uh, coming up on what 120 uh, three years or so uh, uh, after the publication of Souls of Black Folk. If we look at what's taking place in our country uh, today around issues of equality, democracy, the emergence of what looked like uh, another cultural war taking place, that if we read Divorce of the Souls of Black Folk, we will see that we've been here before. Hi, this is Tony Williams, Senior Fellow at the Bill of Rights Institute, and we are pleased to bring you another episode in the Scholar Talk series on Black intellectuals and the African American experience. For this episode, we're honored to have scholar Dr. Derek Allridge, who is going to discuss W.E.B. Du Bois. Derek Allridge is Professor of Education and an affiliate faculty member in the Carter G. Woodson Institute for African American and African Studies. He focuses on African American education and the civil rights movement. And he is the author of, among several books, The Educational Thought of W.E.B. Du Bois and Intellectual History, and the co-editor of the Black Intellectual Tradition in the United States in the 20th century. He serves as the associate editor for the Journal of African American History, and is also the founder, director, and principal investigator of Teachers in the Movement, an oral history project on teachers in the civil rights movement. That just sounds fascinating. So uh, Derek, I wanna thank you very much for joining us and all your great work. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. All right, well, my first question is uh, a little bit of an introductory question. And uh, so can you maybe start by giving us a, a little, a brief overview of, of who W.E.B. Du Bois was and maybe some of his views on, on what were the black struggles during the late 19th and early 20th century? Okay, sure, sure. So to begin, uh, Du Bois was born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts on February 23rd, 1868. You know, he would attend uh, school in Great Barrington, graduated from Great Barrington High School, uh, was interested in going to Harvard uh, uh, to study as an undergraduate at first, but decided to um, attend Fisk University down in Nashville, Tennessee. And it was at Fisk that the world was opened up to him, or I think it would, better, it would be better to say the Black world was opened up to, to the boys. During this period, he uh, uh, was in close interaction with uh, other Black students, uh, many Black people, but he was also in close proximity with uh, African Americans who were only a few decades removed from slavery or had a memory of slavery. And so during his time at Fisk, uh, for two summers, he went out into the, what he called the hills of Tennessee to teach uh, school. Uh, uh, and it was a great experience for him. It was an eye-opening experience for him in terms of allowing him to see what Black was like, Black life was like in the South, something that he hadn't been you know, exposed to previously. So that really kind of um, you know, was revolutionary, a revolutionary period in his intellectual uh, development. After um, Fisk, he, he traveled to Harvard after graduating from Fisk received another uh, uh, bachelor's degree at Harvard. And then he would go on to receive an MA in history from Harvard. And after that, he would uh, spend some time at the University of Berlin uh, working on his PhD and uh, ran out of money and returned. And as he said, he had to accept getting a PhD in history from Harvard. <laughs> and that just gives you a sense of what kind of person Du Bois was. But you know, throughout his studies, there was one thing that he uh, became committed to from his studies, but also from his observations. And that was the idea that he could use social science to solve the so-called Negro problem. And the Negro problem was a term that was used quite frequently in the late 19th, early 20th century. And for the most part, the Negro problem it was a problem, uh, was a question. Some people called it a question. And the question or problem was, what do we do with these recently free Black people or Black people who are just a few decades removed from slavery? What, what, what do we do with them? What is their future? 
And if you read the work of George Fredrickson, he tells you that uh, even some progressive social scientists at the time in looking at the Negro problem, so-called Negro problem, believed that the Negro would be extinct in just a few years, uh, you know, after the 20th century. He said, you know, we, we shouldn't put, uh, he, he argued that some progressives said there was no use in putting uh, major amounts of funding, uh, of money into solving the Negro problem because the Negro would become extinct, right? Because of, you know, his problems, his mental inferiority, et cetera. So Du Bois was very sensitive about this. And of course, he did not buy into the idea of Negro mental inferiority. And he also argued uh, in an essay called The Conservation of Races, you know, race was a social construct anyway. So he set out during the early part of the 20th century to address the Negro problem by producing social science research and showing that the Negro or African-Americans were not actually inferior. So he published a study called the Philadelphia Negro, which was a study of the seventh ward in Philadelphia, which was published in 1899. And this was a social science study to show that African-Americans faced uh, discrimination. They faced a lot of problems that were due to their economic situation, et cetera, that really put them in the position that they were in, in terms of uh, not climbing up the social and economic ladder. So he committed the first part of his career, his life, that 20th century, late 19th century, early 20th century, to solving or addressing the Negro problem through social science research until something happened. And I'm, not, I'm gonna stop there because I know you wanna get to the next question, but this is the, the context within which Du Bois uh, worked in their late 19th, early 20th century. Right, very, very helpful, thank you. So uh, my next question is Du Bois wrote of a, a veil or a double consciousness experienced by black Americans in the souls of black folk. What did he mean by uh, these terms and, and how did he apply them to understanding the African-American experience? Yeah, so, you know, one of Du Bois is uh, prob probably most, many people know Du Bois uh, by his uh, seminal work, The Souls of Black Folk, uh, which was written in 1903. And I, I should say that The Souls of Black Folk is really a compilation of essays that Du Bois um, had, had you know, written and, and brought together into one cohesive piece. And it's been said by some historians that the two most popular books to be found uh, in an African-American household in the early part of the 20th century would be the Bible and Du Bois' The Souls of Black Folk because The Souls of Black Folk spoke to the African-American condition in a very uh, literary way, but also in a historical way. So when Du Bois talked about this concept of double consciousness, he was you know, speaking for African-Americans that they find themselves in this dilemma. And this dilemma was on the one hand, African-Americans are encouraged uh, to be Americans, to do what Americans do, uh, to, 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 to buy into this notion of a meritocracy, right? And to uplift themselves to higher levels of civilization, right? But at the same time, African-Americans were not treated as Americans. They were discriminated against. Uh, we have, you know, uh, you know, Jim Crow, all these kinds of discriminatory practices that African-Americans experienced in the first part of the 20th century. And he said, there's a tension there. And that tension is, am I African? Am I black? Because I'm sure being discriminated against. And he said, but at the same time, I'm told that I'm American. So what do I do with this dilemma, right? And so uh, if you look at Du Bois's writings, uh, he says over the period, he, he, he gives us a solution. He said that we can transcend this double consciousness or the psychic duality. And I think it would be fitting here if I was just to read just a piece of what Du Bois said about uh, double consciousness. And he said, after the Egyptian and the Indian, the Greek and the Roman, the Teuton and the Mongolian, the Negro is a sort of seventh son, born with a veil, and gifted with second sight in this American world. 
a world which yields him no self-consciousness, but only lets himself see through the revelation of the other world. And he goes on and he says, one ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals and one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. Beautiful world, words that express the condition of blacks in the early part of the 20th century. But in souls, Du Bois doesn't give us great detail in terms of how one can transcend this double consciousness. But he does in his novels. And many people don't know that. Some argue, some, one scholar has argued that, you know, that Du Bois kind of abandoned his concept of double consciousness after uh, the souls of black folk, after 1903 and certainly after 1907. I would argue that if you look at the many novels that Du Bois wrote, his published and unpublished novels, he does provide us with some insights on how African Americans can tr transcend double consciousness. And in his stories, the protagonist always experiences this double consciousness when she or he moves outside of the black community, right? And in some cases, they experience this kind of schizophrenia, this kind of mental instability. But when the protagonist re-engages the black community, black culture, and black history to navigate the larger white society, he or she is able to do so with sound foot, right? In the, with, with their grounding in the African-American experience. And that was the only way he argued that blacks could engage this sense of double consciousness or to transcend it would be to always go back to the black community, to black culture, right? And we find this throughout his many, as I said, his writings, his novels, even um, in some of his, um, you know, his correspondence, he, he mentions this. So uh, right. this is what he means by double consciousness. And that's why this book is so important, Souls of Black Folk. Very much so. And I was just going to ask you a follow-up. What do you think is the lasting importance of the Souls of Black Folk? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I was just thinking about this uh, uh, a few months ago, that while much has changed, uh, and it has in terms of, you know, issues of Equality for African Americans is a very much different world today than it was in 1903. But at the same time, there are uh, problems around race and inequality continue to persist. And I'm reminded what um, um, that Du Bois died, I think it was the day before the March on Washington in uh, 1963, right? Uh, August 28, 1963. And, um, you know, that was fitting, I don't remember the, uh, who, who mentioned this, but someone, one of the speakers mentioned that it was Du Bois, the souls of black folk in 1903, that was calling the marchers uh, to Washington DC in 1963. And that what he wrote about the experiences of black people in 1903 was as relevant in 1903 as it was to 1963. And I thought that was a very, um, you know, profound, profound statement. And I would argue that we're now what, uh, coming up on what, 123 uh, years or so uh, uh, after the publication of Souls of Black Folk, if we look at what's taking place in our country uh, today around issues of equality, democracy, the, emergence of what looked like uh, another cultural war taking place, that if we read Du Bois as the Souls of Black Folk, we will see that we've been here before. And I think I would encourage folks to, to read The Souls of Black Folk and think about the legacy of what he's written about double consciousness, issues of race, culture. Right, very, very interesting bridge from, from the Maybe for more distant past to the the more recent past, uh, I didn't I had forgotten he he died on that day and and then to the present. That's that's very very well put. So you've done a lot of scholarly work on Du Bois's views on education. What was his concept of the talented tenth, which I think you you mentioned briefly, and what was the significance of education for Du Bois in terms of achieving? greater black equality and justice in the American regime? 
Yeah, yeah. So uh, Du Bois had actually, uh, in term, the term, the, the idea of the town to temple course was popularized uh, in the souls of black folk, but Du Bois had actually mentioned the term uh, in some of his earlier works. Uh, but du, that Du Bois's concept of the town to temple was uh, similar to some of the ideas of um, Thomas Jefferson, all right, in terms of having an educated citizenry. And so that's very important to know. But Du Bois believed that it was a responsibility of the most educated African-Americans, uh, the most economically secure African-Americans to uplift uh, the black masses. And he believed that he was certainly a part of this town to 10th. Uh, and he talked about this quite often. He even mentioned this in his notebooks, um, in his diary, so to speak. And when he was at the University of Berlin, he dedicated himself in his diary as the Moses of his people. And he said that it was his responsibility, along with other people who were educated like him, to uplift um, uh, you know, the black masses. And he really believed in that. And he identified you know, individuals that he thought should be doing that. And he called these individuals the college-bred Negroes, right? And wrote frequently about this uh, and spoke frequently about college-bred Negroes in the first part of the 20th century. Um, one of the challenges that we see in the, his not one of, one of, something we see in the historical literature that I think we need to pay attention to. There's this idea that Du Bois supported this idea of the talented temp who should receive a classical and liberal education. Whereas Booker T. Washington was his polar opposite and uh, really wasn't an advocate of the talented temp, but believed that African-Americans should de dedicate themselves to vocational and industrial education. So to be clear, um, that dichotomy is somewhat of a false dichotomy. There is some truth to that, uh, uh, to that, that idea. But Du Bois never disavowed vocational industrial education in and, of, in and of itself as a bad thing for some African Americans. He recognized that there were some people who would receive uh, college education or higher education whose responsibility was to uplift the others, uh, other African-Americans. But he recognized that there, was, there were some people who would build this kind of economic floor or economic base who would serve as, uh, you, who become artists, who would uh, uh, make their way in industry and in the vocations. So I think teachers, educators need to be um, you know, cognizant of this when they teach about uh, the dichotomy or dialectic between Washington and Du Bois. Uh, they were different in their approach, but there also was some similarities. And Du Bois himself would note this later on after Washington's death that um, pretty much that that debate, so-called debate and discussion was not useful anymore. And that the world was a much more complex place for black Americans uh, than it was in the earlier part of the 20th century when that debate was pretty much a part of the consciousness of uh, what we thought black education should be. And, and, and I should say one other thing, if you don't mind. This gets, in 1948, Du Bois gave a speech called the Talented Tiff Memorial Address in which he called, in which he called out the Talented Tiff for not reaching back and uplifting uplifting the black masses. So uh, that should be pointed out. And some people argue that in the town to 10th Memorial Address, Du Bois completely jettisoned the idea of the town to 10th. I would argue that he did not, but that he did call them out. And, did, and, and, and he offered another approach. He said, instead of calling this the town to 10th, I argue that we should promote the idea of the guiding hundredth. And the guiding hundred was a concept in which Du Bois believed all African Americans should be trained for some type of leadership moving forward, right? And so that was a little more nuanced perspective of his his talented tenth uh, address. Mm 
of, of his talent to Tim philosophy. Right. Excellent. Uh, and my final question, uh, pretty broad, but what was uh, W.E.B. Du Bois's contribution to understanding the Black experience in America? Oh, there were there were many. And yeah, that is a, a broad, broad <laughs> question. It's a great question. It's hard to understand. It's, it's hard to nail down one thing because he did uh, so many. Uh, a good friend of mine uh, and, and colleague at Penn State, uh, retired professor named Wilson Moses, I asked him a question, a similar question once. And I said, you know, Du Bois did so much. What, what were his contributions? And in fact, when I read Du Bois closely, I learned that he seemed to contradict himself uh, over time. And, you know, what, 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 do I, what do I do with that as I began to write about Du Bois and his thinking? And I would like to share with you what Professor Moses told me. He sent me an email. He said, while some scholars argue that Du Bois changes his thinking quite a bit, another approach might be to recognize patterns of consistency accompanied by patterns of evolution. Or it might be correct to say that his personality did not change, while some of his ideas did. Or you might say that he continued to put old wine in new bottles. On the other hand, you might say he changed radically and fundamentally on some issues. Or you might say that while he believed himself to be changing, he was a real stick in the mud. Or you might say all or some combination of the above, in which case Du Bois would be like most people who live past 40. And so when, 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 whenever I'm asked that question, I say, all right, so what Du Bois are we talking about? But I think we can look at Du Bois in different periods. But overall, I'm going to take a stab at that and say this, that his greatest contribution, I think, uh, to African-Americans is uh, his contributions in terms of teaching them about their own history and their own culture. Right, Du Bois wrote many books. Many of them were uh, uh, textbooks, uh, could, could be textbooks. They're history books. And I'm thinking about his book, The World in Africa, The Negro, his book on John Brown, countless books and countless essays that educated blacks about their own history. One of the most powerful uh, historical uh, pieces of literature that Du Bois was involved in was the Crisis Magazine, which he served as the editor of from, I think it's 1910 to 1934. And in the Crisis Magazine, you can actually see Du Bois's imprint all over it, or he's, you can see him in it because he's constantly providing uh, vignettes uh, of African-American history. He's constantly featuring, um, you know, uh, stories about uh, Black heroines and heroes. And this is the way that he educated the Black um, African Americans. And I would argue that his work in the crisis was one way of him addressing the duality of double consciousness. And he also published something called the Brownies Book, which was a children's magazine, which focused on teaching African American children about their history. So I would say, his greatest contribution would be, uh, you know, teaching black people about their history and culture. Eric, I want to thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. I, I, I bet my viewers will very much agree with me that uh, we could listen to you all day. Uh, and that it's such an important conversation. I, I wish we, we had a few hours, but, uh, but thank you again. And uh, again, you can check out W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, the educational thought of W.E.B. Du Bois and intellectual history and teachers in the movement. I want to thank you all for joining us on this episode of Scholar Talks. Please check out our other installments of Black Intellectuals and the African American Experience, as well as our previous series on the Cold War and the Presidency and our upcoming series on pivotal battles in American history. Thank you.